All right, if you have your Bibles with you this evening, we'd ask that you turn to Psalms, Psalms 121, the 121st Psalm is where we'll take our text tonight, uh, Psalms 121, and we're going to begin reading there in the first verse, Psalms 121, in the first verse, and the author is not given, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer any foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he keepeth Israel. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord will preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth, even and even forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your precious word. We uh, praise you for the comfort it gives give us get, that it gives us in an unsettled day. Lord, we thank you uh, for your people that choose to meet together, Lord, when uh, the world seems so alluring and entertaining in the days in which we live. We pray that you would strengthen us together and that we desire more than ever to be in and about your word. Lord, we pray tonight that the situation with the roof would be taken care of uh, to your glory and your honor, and we commit that to you as well. God, we pray that you would bless your word this evening. We pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, we'll be preaching tonight uh, uh, on your the best place to be. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times when I'm this way, my best place to be is at home. I always look forward when I swing into the drive and start up the hill to the house because I know the day is over with. Uh, but that's not my best place to be. I, I think it is sometime, but it's not. The best place for me to be is in the center of God's will. And the best place for you to be is in the very center of God's will. Amen. Whether it be at your house or whether it be at the church house or whether it be on the other side of the earth, being in God's will is where we need to be. Now, in the first verse, the psalmist begins, I will lift up unto I will lift up mine eyes unto the unto the hills from whence cometh my help. Now, uh, for, for the psalmist to say this, I have to assume there's something challenging going on. Because what, why would he be looking for help if there was no situation of distress before him? You don't look for help unless you're threatened. You don't look for help unless there's a reason to do so. There's a threat. There's a need. There's something going on in your life. Now, we can see that easily on the physical side. We can see it on a daily basis. When we go to the grocery and we go to the gas station, listen, our needs are getting more and more acute. And listen, we've got another year, uh, two and a half years of this. Uh, who knows what the Lord might do? And so we find that, yes, we can see that, but often we don't place it on the spiritual side. You, you know what threatens Baptists is if you if all you dwell in is the security of the believer, your closeness to Jesus means nothing. Uh, yeah. uh, there's a far difference between be, being saved and being in the will of God. Mm -hmm. There's a far difference between being saved and being near unto Christ. The, uh, now, you can't do the other two without being saved, but you can be saved and be far from it. Uh, you, can, you cannot be walking in sweet fellowship and still be a saved individual. So we don't understand what the threat to the psalmist was, 
but we know there is one, and we know that there is one for us every day. Now, as we get deeper into the psalm, we'll see that it was both a personal threat and a national threat. Israel was in trouble. You know what? You look about the, uh, the chaos in our land today. Listen, our nation is in trouble. Uh, you don't know what you will do when you, and, until you get hungry. Uh, you can always say, I won't do that and I won't do this. Well, when it comes down to food, that's a totally different thing. And when it comes down to food for your babies, that's another thing still. And, and so uh, with view of that, you know what? Sometimes, I'll, I'll just be honest, sometimes I do feel threatened. Sometimes I do get distressed. I wonder what I will do. And then what the Bible tells me to do is look to the hills which cometh my help. You know what? Who can solve all these problems? You, you remember the destitute situation in Israel when they were under siege and a mule's head was going for 50 pieces of silver and the next day they were overrun with food in one day's time see the God we serve can switch things around it's just like that and, and so we see that what the devil would have us to do what Satan its keen design is is to take our minds off Christ to take our eyes off Christ you ever thought about the first sin with Adam and Eve there in the garden? You know what she really did? She took her eyes off God's provision. What God gave wasn't good enough, and what the world gave was an allurement. And she jumped on it. And so the very same thing with us. And so the psalmist, whomever he was, uh, said, I'm going to look on to the Lord. I'm going to look from where my help has always come up to now. Verse 2, he reiterates that, my help cometh from the Lord. Now, that has not changed. That will never change. You know where my help comes? It comes from the Lord. You know why I'm able to get up and walk around on two feet? It's because of the Lord. You know why I'm a saved man tonight and one day going home to glory? It's because of the Lord. That's where my help comes from. Amen. There's nothing good that I've ever done. Everything comes from the Lord. Uh, and I'll go a step further. I would say it's impossibility good, uh, for good to come from mankind without the Lord. Yeah. Uh, you know, even when you see lost people uh, do good things, maybe provision for the poor, you know why they do that? The Lord wants them to. If he can make Balaam's ass preach, he can do pretty much anything he wants to. He can get glory out of a rock. That's what the Bible says, is it not? Said so if, if these don't if if these hush, the, the rocks are going to cry out. Right. See, that's the God we serve. So whatever's going on in our life, emotionally or financially or whatever the situation is, we find that the help comes from the Lord. Notice He gives begins to remind the people how great their God is, which made heaven and earth now can you imagine the glory and i just stand amazed sometimes looking around at the beauty uh, of the lord's creation and and the beautiful hills of stewart county and when i come home every day from work and you cross the tennessee river and you just see rolling hills as you're coming into stewart county and, and i think about the beauty that's involved in that but can you imagine the beauty that existed before sin began we, we live in a sin-cursed world. Can you imagine what it looked like before that occurred? It, it, it's unimaginable. When you can pet a snake and cuddle up with a lion, well, well, what a magnificent thing. What, what, how, how far it is that we've come. That's the God we serve. He made everything about us. Everything that's around us, He provided it all. So why do we fear? Why do we get stressed out? Well, I, I can tell you, number one is your flesh. And number two, we spend more time watching TV than we do reading this. 
You, you know, I, I fully believe the TV, you, you can't believe half of what it says, even Fox. And they put images, is the, the most cruel images they can right. to scare us. Mm -hmm. You remember that. And I'm not saying all that happened, and, and I know it's genuine what happened in the Ukraine, but listen, they're going to make people look desperate to make you feel alarmed. That, that, that is the goal. That, that is what they want, is to create a situation of desperation. And when they do that, they kind of got you in the crook. And, and so instead of buying in all, into all of that and, and becoming uh, so fearful, remember who our Lord is. He made the whole thing. Verse 3, he will not suffer thy foot to be moved. Now what a glorious, glorious truth. Listen, nothing's going to happen to us unless it's authored by God. You know, you remember that little song we sung in Bible school, I shall not be, I shall not be moved? You know why that's true? It's because it's authored by God. It's not that you're going to hang on. It's because He's hanging on to you. Uh, and so we see then the rich truth in that. You know what? If you run out of money, it's because God wants you to run out of money. Because he's the provider. If he wants you to have something, you know what? You're going to have it. And if he wants to stop it, you know what? You can try the rest of your life and you still won't have it. That's the God we serve. And so the psalmist here, as he's, as he's proclaiming these things, he wants to remind the people that their provider is not self, but rather God. He keeps you still. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Now, isn't that a wonderful truth? When you, uh, when you go to bed at night, when you fall asleep, uh, there's one watching over you. You don't have to stress about it. When the tornado warning comes out, you can snuggle up on that pillow and just sleep as, as sound as you can because, see, there's one greater than you watching over you. Yeah. Amen. You, you don't have to stress about it. I have a friend, uh, I, he was my patient, and I, as soon as he gets his tomato sign up, I'm going to go get me some tomatoes from him. But um, I, I noticed I was coming by his house. I guess that last bad windstorm has took about half his roof off. I just noticed it today, I'm going to go by there. But I, I want you to see <laughs> when uh, we were talking about the last tornado in December, you know, we're talking about that when I was caring for him. And he, uh, he said, were you scared? And I said, well, first of all, no, because I was 800 miles away in Florida. And I said, secondly, no. I said, I wanted to hear from my family, but I had committed that to the Lord when I left. And he looked at me like I had three heads. And he said, well, when it came over our house, I was scared. And I said, I can see being careful, but I said, what about eternity? And he looked real funny. And I, I could tell I hit a little something with him. He was thinking about the here and now. Now my wife and my mother-in-law will remember Miss Courtney Winters at the nursing home. It's her nephew. And uh, uh, we laughed when we realized we both knew her. Uh, but I'm not worried about <laughs> going. Sometimes I worry about how I'll go, but I'm not worried about going. Uh, and, and so he reminds them, listen, you're not going to be moved without the Almighty being involved in it. He never sleeps. He never goes to sleep. He's always our provider. Verse 4, Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Now, you think about that, and, and uh, we understand it, and it happened a number of years before I was born. In, in 1948, the, the nation of Israel became a true nation again and was rebirthed. But you know, there was always a people of Israel. When Israel became a nation, they flocked in there and went back to their homeland because they never ceased to exist. You know, everybody thinks about a country as the amount of land that they possess 
what a people is, is who they are. Now, we talk about repairs on the building, and uh, praise God, I hope it goes well, but if we lose the building, New Testament church is still here. And if Israel had lost their landmass, Israel is still a people. And he made that promise to them. They'll always be distinct. They'll always be a specific group of people. And, and that is uh, his promise to us. Hey, you got my protection. Israel has my protection. You have my protection. You will be a people. What a wonderful verse. Verse 5, the Lord is my keeper. Now, a keeper is a, is a uh, shepherd's term. A keeper is one that feeds. A keeper is one that protects, keeps the, the, the varmints away from the sheep. He feeds the sheep. And at night when the sheep are sleeping, he's on the watch. That's a keeper. Uh, isn't it a wonderful thing that we have a keeper so sufficient the Lord Jesus Christ, and during the end of his ministry, he said, Behold, I'll send you a comforter. That's the keeper. That's what will keep you out of trouble. That's what, what comes to you uh, when you're getting far from the Lord. And he says, Buddy, you better get back. When, when you do something <clears throat> sinful and he comes by and whips you up one side and down the other, that's a good keeper. That's, that's, a, that's an individual doing what what needs to be done whipping a child in parenting ain't the favorite part of parenting but you know what you're doing that child well you're being faithful to your purpose and, and, and so we find then what better could we have when the when the world may be falling apart and it seems here we find we have this glorious keeper the lord is thy keeper the Lord is thy shade upon the right hand. In other words, you're not going to be boiling over. You're not going to be heating up. You're not going to be distressed in the hot spiritual summer because the Lord is going to shade you. He's going to provide for you. He's going to be the one that helps you through. <laughs> the sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. And you know why? Who's the controller of each? Now, me and Sister Diane was talking and she's wanting rain and I'm not wanting rain. You know, uh, you know what will be the best? Whatever the Lord sends. I want to mow my bank that Donna says doesn't need to be mowed anyway and she's needing rain on her vegetables. You know what? If rain comes, I'll love it. And if it doesn't, I love it too. You see what I'm saying? Understanding the provision of the shepherd is everything. Because he's not going to give you anything that's not needful. Right. Even when you need a good lesson and a good uh, spanking on your backside, it's still needful. It's still a good thing. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think what Hebrew says. Uh, no... No, uh, it's not punishment. No chastening seemeth good for a season. <laughs> that means when it's happening. But later, but later on, you see the benefit and the glory of it. And, and, and that is his provision always. So whatever comes, uh, moon or sunshine, it is for our benefit and for our good. I love this. The Lord shall preserve thee from evil. <laughs> I cannot believe people reading this passage and believing you can be lost and saved again. <laughs> or saved and then lost. You know why I'm saved? is because he keeps me from evil. He keeps me from Satan. It's nothing extraordinary that I have done. It's his power and his glory and his ability. That is the difference. What, what a rich, rich promise. We run through those things like it ain't nothing. But listen, that, that is our hope. As things are falling apart by the seams, that is the only hope that you have. 
Lost person, that's your only, and as the world is going down, as we know it, all around us, that is your only hope, is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Uh, that, that's, your, that's your only solace. You, you know what? <clears throat> Lost people will be swept away in the economic times that we live because they have no solace. They don't have that faith to hold to. And so the terrifying news that we see will sweep them away. When our hope is in the Lord. And, and so we find as the psalmist is writing, he's reminding us and reminding Israel that the strength is not them, but, be, but would be preserved by the Lord. The Lord shall preserve thee from evil. He shall preserve thy soul. You know, I was talking to a Campbellite preacher a few weeks ago, and he said, well, we don't read the Old Testament. And I said, well, that's a shame. <laughs> you know, I wonder what he would do with this one. He, Jesus, the Lord God of heaven, Jehovah, the great God of the Bible, he shall preserve your soul. I don't have to worry about it. I go to sleep at night and don't have to worry if I have, if I have a bad dream, if I have a dream that, that's, not, uh, that's appealing more to the flesh and the spirit. You know, th those people believe if you have a lucid dream, have a lewd dream while you're sleeping and you don't wake up and ask for forgiveness, you're on your way to hell. What a flimsy, flimsy faith. Well, I'm depending on the Lord. Old Brother Garner Smith used to say, I, I have so much trust in the Lord, I'll swing out across hell on a dry corn stalk. And finally, I know exactly what he's saying. I would do it too. Because there's no parting from him. He'll preserve me. He'll, he, he, he'll, he'll cause me that to turn out good and for his glory. What more can we want? What more... If national Israel was going down, what more could they want but a sweet relationship with God? If, if, if we're in the soup line, what more could we want to be standing in the soup line hand in hand with the Lord Jesus Christ? What more could we want? And, and, and so we find that the psalmist has true understanding of trusting the Lord, of in the most dire situations, putting him first. Verse 8, the Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Now, we live in a day of unsureties. Well, I'm just not sure about that. I'm not sure that th that's the Lord's will. A lot of that is stuff that we just want to say because we don't want to do it. And that, that's our cop-out, our spiritual cop-out, right? But I want you to see here, he will preserve our going out and our coming in. If he leaves us to do something, and, and I felt assured back several months ago whenever uh, I was invited to go to Alabama, and you know what? I'm going, and if something don't work out right, you know what? That was the hand of Almighty before all, the all eternity began. Now, man, what a solace. What, what, what a peace. That makes, that, that makes it where you can head out and not worry about which direction you're going in. Because God is sovereign. There, 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 there's nothing outside his understanding. So the psalmist give great solace and great encouragement to Israel if they took this to heart. Now, sometimes I wonder if Israel did or if they did not. But now let's put it down into living terms because reading Psalms is always poetic and, 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 and kind of feely. But let's put it into real life terms. Genesis 22. Uh, this is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, Genesis 22, in the first verse, if you know your Bible, you know where we're going. Uh, and it came to pass after these things that God tempt, did tempt Abraham. 
And said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and, and just for your rest of the uh, week's reading, your private study, notice what God says, thine only son. <laughs> he did not recognize uh, the other son at all. And the reason why, it was not the will of God from the beginning. Uh, he was a fake. He, he, was not, he was not the promised child. And that just gives you something to think about. And he says, uh, Whom thou lovest, get thee into the land of Moriah, and offered him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose early in the morning. Now, I want you to see sometimes, you know, be very careful with your imagination. If it doesn't say it in the Bible, don't assume it's there. Because I fully believe, it didn't say that he tossed and tumbled all night. It didn't say that he cried and, uh, uh, and lashed out at God. It just said that he got God's plan and he was on it the first thing the next morning. I, I believe he slept just like a baby that night. I don't believe he was distressed. I don't believe he was upset. He, I, he knew God had a plan. He, he understood fully that this was the will of God. See, sometimes trusting God and, and sometimes uh, understanding his protection, it's going to be challenged in your life. And he says, I want you to kill that boy. I want you to get up early in the morning, go where I tell you to, and when you get there, I want you to slit his throat. That's how they did it. And, and so uh, that was God's plan. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. See, he was following God's plan, but see, God had made a previous promise that a nation would come out of Isaac. So you know what? He believed both. <laughs> he was obedient to both. You know what? I fully believe Abraham thought if I slit his throat, God's going to raise him up again. Amen. See, he, he had confidence in the provision of God. Now, the question is, in the last days, do we have the confidence that Isaac had? Slit your throat. <laughs> slit, hit, slit, slit the throat of your plan and go with God's. That's a hard thing to do, isn't it? And you know why? Because we cherish our plans. We cherish our ideas. We think we're right. We think what we say is best. You know what you need to do with that? Just slit its throat. Uh, because God's got a better way, and he always does. And so I want you to see through all this, we see no, uh, no frailty, no shaking, no wavering in Abraham's faith. That is how we should be. He had a peace about taking the, son, the life of his own son. Think about having peace about that. You know what? It's an impossibility in the flesh. But you can. You can if you look on God for whom he really is. And unfortunately, often we do not. Uh, in Abra uh, verse 7, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, my father, and he said, here I am, here, here I am, my son. And he says, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order, 
and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now, I've always found the most interesting thing about this, you see no fight from Isaac either. Now, by this point, and I've heard different people say different things, that I, probably Isaac was somewhere between 13 and 17. Now, uh, I know at least you two, and probably you in your day, you know what? At that age, if somebody's going to slit my throat, I was going to put up a fight. So somewhere along the way, Isaac had learned to trust God. Isaac had learned to have confidence and faith in God's plan. We, so, we see no resistance at all from the boy Isaac. I wish I could be like that. Have no resistance at all to God's plan, but I find myself fighting it day and night most of the time. What, what a rich example Isaac is to just willfully lay down there and uh, a big strapping boy. Uh, I often think about this when I'm, I'm studying this section of the scripture. Uh, by the time Adam was 13, he was taller than me already. And he's always been a big strapping boy. Think about me and think about the time he was 17. Think about me trying to do that to Adam and the natural impulse of the flesh to survive. See, what I'm saying is Isaac, and, and by this time Abraham was 120, 117. It'd been, it'd been no match for him. But see, Isaac understood God's plan too. And so we see that that is generational when we give it to our children, when we pass it from one to the other. Verse uh, 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he says, here, I, here am I. And he says, Lay not thine hand unto the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. Amen. See, we, we see the root of the problem in the 12th verse. Today there is no fear at all of the Almighty God of heaven. Now, don't anticipate lost people to fear God because deep in their heart, heart they never will. They may even have respect, but they don't fear God. But, but that should be the hallmark of the redeemed. You know why some people follow God and are obedient and some don't? It's because of whatever fear level they have of God. If you fear Him, you're going to be obedient because you know that there's punishment coming. You know if you say, no, I ain't going to do it, there's going to be repercussions. And maybe even in your children. <laughs> and so you do, you, you, you're obedient. Uh, <laughs> and so we find that it is uh, very necessary that we follow the plan of God always and do it reverently. Last place I'm going to read the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 13, very quickly. Now, you know that the Gospel of John tends to display our Lord Jesus Christ in His glory, uh, display Him as God and, and as the, the very living God on earth. And this text is really no different. The Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 21, Jesus said, and when Jesus had thus said, He was troubled in the Spirit, and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Now, he knew that because he knew God's plan from eternity past. And I also want you to see, despite knowing that, he went with God's plan. See, um, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. I don't think he was sinful. I, he, he operated on a different plane, but he knew 
He knew what temptation was because the tempter came unto him. And I want you to see that here he knows full well from the day that he called Judas into the fellowship exactly who Judas was. The Bible says it was a devil from the beginning. And he flat knew it. And he called him unto the fellowship anyway. And now he reveals what's going to happen. Verse 22, when the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. <laughs> See, they were Baptists. They looked at everybody else. I bet it's him. <laughs> I've always wondered about Thomas. Those, those type of things. Now, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, John, as close as he could get to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where you know his will. That's where you'll find out God's plan. Mm -hmm. And he's laying there, and he says, Whom is it that thou speakest? He says, It's whom I give the sob. No one else knew that. And as soon as Jesus took that sop from the Lord's table, from the old Jewish Passover, and popped it in Judas's mouth, John knew it. Now, we have no record whatsoever that John ever shared that information wherever with anybody else. But you know where he got it? Leaning on Jesus' breast. He got a piece of God's plan that no one else had. That's where you're going to get it. That's where you're going to find solace. You know, you think about all the wandering and saying, you know, it could be Thomas, it could be, it could be Matthew. I don't know who is after this. But John did. John knew two things. It wasn't him, and he knew it was Judas. You know how he got that leaning on Jesus' breast? See, you won't, you won't get that by sitting on the outside. And if you remember this text, and we won't go there for time's sake, it was Peter that says, John, ask him who did it. Who's going to do this thing? You know why? Because Peter was at the other end of the table. He wasn't close to Jesus. And because of his position, within 24 hours, he'll say, I don't even know who you're talking about. Yeah. In very plain language, a lot better than I said, a lot worse than I said. So get close to Jesus. When the storm's coming up, be near him. If you don't know him, seek him with everything you've got. Listen, church, a storm's coming. Amen, that's right. Fair Be sure that you're ready. Amen. Because we have no idea. We've had such a good life here, we have nothing to compare it to. Each and every one of you need to go outside this country at least a couple of times. Uh, when we were in Mexico, Adam will remember this. He had sense enough not to do it. I ate it. But there was roasted grasshoppers with pepper. All over the marketplace, these women would go, huge basket, part of it on their head and part of it out here, and just selling those grasshoppers everywhere they went. You know why they sell them? Because people are hungry. And people will buy them because they're cheap. We've not got there yet, y'all. But we may. Be close to the Lord.